Hey, welcome to this week's edition of Snowmobiler Television. On this week's show, my old Polaris Indy's coming out of storage for the first time in 10 years and getting fired up. Then we've also got the Polaris Indy Evo up for first burn. We've also got a story about why you need to be thinking about how your trailer D-rings are mounted with some destructive testing. So let's get the show going. STV is brought to you by Yamaha. Conquer snow with Yamaha. Ultimax belts. Performance driven, performance proven. Ford F-Series Canada's best selling line of trucks for 53 years. Tough, smart, capable. D-rings. A fancy trailer like this one, and there's never enough of them, or they're not in the right place. So OCD me wants to install more, but not only do I want to install them in the right place so I can tie down more sleds, I also want to make sure that they're installed correctly. So I'm not just going to use wood screws to attach them to the floor because I know that would never hold in an emergency. All this sounds super boring. And I don't want to show you how to install a D-ring, that's pretty simple. Instead, I want to show you why you want to install a D-ring correctly with destructive testing. I mean, any old TV show can show you how to install one of these things. This is going to be way more fun. To do this, I have to break out the welder and build a test rig that will let me secure a piece of plywood about 16 by 24 inches with a D-ring mounted in the middle that represents a typical trailer floor of an enclosed trailer. And then we're going to use the power of this forklift to pull on the straps to the point of failure. Now, this rig kind of represents a trailer floor and it's mounted here at 45 degrees to basically represent the 45 degree angle that your strap would be on from the trailer floor up to your, the rear bumper of your snowmobile. Now, obviously this one's pulling vertically where in a trailer it would be horizontal, but you get the picture. And by the way, if we get to the point where we start breaking straps, where this one's rated for a thousand pounds, I'm gonna put bigger straps on because I'm not stopping until we destroy plywood. This guy is just screwed in with three red screws and two of them are into plastic. So no chance they're gonna break that strap. This is gonna be very undramatic. So why don't you hit it? I'm gonna stay, it's gonna be so undramatic. I'm gonna stay right here with my safety glasses on and I'll just watch this thing do what it's gonna do. There's some drama there, but really didn't hold much. So that was just a wood screw, pulled right out, left everything behind. Uh, we've got another one that's flush mount with a whole bunch more screws in it. Let's try that one next. Who built this? This is very professional. All right, so I'll just lower this down again. We'll keep going up from there. So this one is still just screwed in with wood screws, what? but uh, we've got six of them now. That was more dramatic. That was, that had some spice to it, but it just pulled all the screws out again. Yep. Really didn't slow the rig down at all. Uh, that strap rated a thousand pounds. It was way less than that. Did no damage to the strap. And let's see, yeah, no damage to that. So that's not gonna hold anything. Next up is a logistics system sent to us by Superclamp. This modular design has rings that clip into place along the length of the aluminum mount. This one is bolted through the plywood using only the supplied hardware. That did something. So it pulled through. Yeah, it just pulled the bolts right through that. You know, it didn't even bend that. It just pulled them through. Yeah. I'm gonna take this guy up a bit. We've got the same thing on this side, but with an aluminum backer on the back side. So simulate being strapped to a frame. Yeah, so I think this is gonna have a lot more pop to it. Okay. This might be dramatic. All right, so here's basically the same type of strap. This one's got a load limit of 
1,670 pounds. So we'll see what happens. It's quite a bit more than the last one. Hey, look at that. We stopped the lift. Whoa! What's happening? Look at the bow in there. That's cool. Still, still making unhappy noises. Okay, now, in order to get more strength, we need a doubler. We need a doubler. That did it. So that's all we needed. We more ran. power. Oh, look at that. That completely destroyed the plywood. So I'm super impressed with this one. Uh, way more uh, tensile strength here than I thought. The amount of wood that it broke away here, uh, I mean, it's pretty amazing. But you can see how just the addition of a small backer on the back compared to this guy that just pulled those screws through the uh, plywood made a huge difference. Backers are a good thing. We are now getting into heavy duty D-rings. These would typically be used in large trailers securing cars in place. Now this E-Track mount has interchangeable rings or straps that can be clipped into place. Now this comes as a kit and again, we're using only the supplied fasteners. But this one has heavy duty body washers as reinforcements. Well that wasn't dramatic at all. Yeah. So that just ripped it right out of the floor. But I think what happened here, the fact that we just had the big, now they're big thick washers, they didn't move, but it just ripped the plywood. Yeah. So, I mean, if this was maybe a square backer and spread the load over the back of the, uh, the floor a bit more, I think it would have been Makes better. Makes a significant difference. I'm very disappointed in that. That, that did not hold as much as those little E-Track things did. Yeah. Okay, so this is the one that I thought is gonna hold the most. These D-rings I've installed in trailers to haul cars and stuff like that, but yeah. it's got the biggest backer. That's a significant backer. But this is what I'll do in a, in a race trailer to put race cars in. and. This is typical, so I'm interested to see how this is gonna work. I think this is gonna stall everything. Okay. All right, slide her in. What'd that do? What broke? It unwound the ratchet. Well, that wasn't supposed to do that. It broke the ratchet. Did it break the what? It broke the ratchet. The ratchet's broken. Whoa. I have never seen that happen. Yeah, that's yeah. completely broken right Snap there. Snap the ratchet off. Well, all we have to do now is get a bigger ratchet. That's what that tells me. <laughs> all right, so. Hang on, lots of strap. These ones are 3,300 pounds. Typical what you'd find on like hauling lumber and stuff like that, but you may notice that we're using old straps. But for the keen observer at home, this is on purpose because this is kind of how they live in the wild. You know, the straps get knocked around a bit and they're not always pristine. So we're trying to, we're trying to be realistic here. Somewhat. Oh, it was coming. That's got a lot of stress in there. I think it's gonna go again because we're, we're hearing wood snap. That's pretty good though. So we got at least 2,500 pounds on that. Okay, leave it there for a sec. Look how much that's pulled. Yeah. I'm gonna try something. I'm not done yet. Well, that was a result. That definitely held a lot. I mean, we're over a ton of vertical lift. Plus I had this bar in here, kind of help pulling it down. So whatever that was worth. But yeah, we had, well over a ton of uh, pressure on that, so. Wow. Yeah. Just to back up. But that's, plate. A, that's only a ton. I mean, think of uh, of a car. This would pull, a car would pull this out of the floor even. Yeah, in an, in an accident, that would come right off. Yeah, a car that weighs 3,000 pounds. I mean, you're gonna have two of these on it, so it kind of doubles it up, but still. Awesome. What is better than destructive testing in slow-mo? I have no idea, but this is quite an impressive pile of carnage that we have and shrapnel on the floor. But 
Got one other idea. It's a little outside the box, but we'll see what happens. Coming up later in the show, we've got more destructive testing. But up next, after the break, Polaris's Evo is up in first burn. It's easy for a manufacturer to design and sell a sled based on performance because let's face it, we all want the latest and greatest, the most powerful, the most accessorized, the most belled and whistled snowmobile there is, or at least the most that we can afford. Instead, I think it takes real chutzpah for a manufacturer to design and build a sled that either defines or redefines a market segment outside of this performance box. And the segment I'm talking about is the Evolution segment. For 2019, Polaris has defined this market with the Evo snowmobile. The Evo is more than just a redecaled 550 fan. Instead, it's a purpose-built snowmobile made for riders that are right between the 120-200 class snowmobiles and a full-size machine. Now you might be wondering why somebody wouldn't buy a Polaris 550 fan. Well, that's simple. And that's because that sled and others like it are built with large adults in mind, where the Evo is built specifically for small and young riders. This sled is sized to fit them, and Polaris has done this by lowering the handlebars and fitting a seat with much less rise to it to fit smaller bodies. The suspension is lower as well, making the overall sled closer to the ground to be less intimidating, and it's speed limited to 50 miles an hour or about 70 kilometers an hour, which should make parents happy. Take for example the 120 class sleds that seem to depreciate to a value and then stay there for the rest of their existence, assuming they're in half decent shape. Now it looks like the 200 class sleds are going down that same path and I think the Evo is going to follow that same trend, which means when it comes time to trading this thing in, it's still going to be worth some pretty good money. Even when you look at the investment it takes to bring a youngster up through the ranks from their very first 120 snowmobile, then up to the 200 class snow scoots and on into the Evo class, I don't think the expense is as bad as you think. And then there's riding the Evo, which is a ton of fun for even us adults. The sled really does have that light, nimble feel, which I think youngsters will appreciate. You can get on the gas fast without the sled doing anything unexpected, but the 550 fan still has enough power to spin the track for a little bit of fun. And while for me, the speed limiter seemed to kick in a bit too early, it will keep shenanigans to a minimum. The Evo is confidence inspiring because of its ease of use and proportionate size for young riders, but it still has that real snowmobile feel to it with the same type of gauges, electronic reverse and switch gear that are found on regular sleds. It's these features that make the Evo a much better choice for young riders over a full-size Polaris 550 fan or a 600 class liquid snowmobile. These bigger sleds will ultimately lead kids into a struggle to control the machine, which could potentially get them into a situation that is beyond their skill level and into trouble. The Evo and sleds like it are the key to the future of snowmobiling. Not because I think we're all going to trade in our 850s and start riding Evos. Instead, I think these machines are going to turn the youth that ride them into enthusiasts and they're going to be the future of snowmobiling. Putting my 13 year old cap on, I think I'd be super happy with a sled like the Evo to run around the backyard with and then go out on the trail with my folks. Even up through the ages of 14, 15 and 16, the Evo is a relevant snowmobile that I think kids in this age bracket would be happy to ride on without a paper bag on their head. After these ages, kids will probably have their own ideas as to what they want to ride, but maybe by that point, they've had a summer job or two to help pay for their next snowmobile and the Evo can be used as a trade-in. These sleds also represent an excellent way to develop a better bond between mom and dad and the kids without having a screen in the middle and it may even have the potential to get the kids active in the snowmobile community if sledding is something they really want to do. So far speaking to Polaris dealerships, we've been told that they've been receiving a ton of phone calls on the Evo and have sold through on their stock, which means it looks like the Evo is being well received in the marketplace. 
I hope this continues to be the case because I truly believe that sleds like the Evo and the smaller 200 and 120 class sleds are the perfect way to make sure that snowmobiling survives into the future with a new generation of kids that will become enthusiasts. One of my goals for this year is to go on a ride on a three-cylinder, two-stroke snowmobile. And the sled I want to do that on is my 1990 Indy 650. So it's time to get this old girl off the shelf. Like any sled that's been sitting for a long time, I suspect I'm going to have issues with the fuel system. So I'm going to start with taking the carbs apart and cleaning the tank. I am lucky that this thing lived inside, so I'm hoping my list of stuff to do is pretty short. Four-stroke guys can't do that. So it looks like I had a win for me. Not only was I thinking ahead, I actually was acting on it. So I believe in addition to the fuel stabilizer, I may have actually run the sled dry of fuel so there's nothing in the bowls to go bad. It really does show if you put things away properly, it can save a lot of work in the long run. So how do you know if your fuel line's bad? It's pretty easy. Good fuel line, nice and flexible. Bad fuel line. It's petrified. So a little tech, uh, ah. tastes like two stroke. Tech tip of the day, if you have trouble getting these lines back on the barb over top of the carburetor or whatever, just chew on it for a little bit. It seems to move rubber around, warm it up. And then when you go to put it back on, it's a lot easier, just like that. So here's another little thing that we found. The fuel pickup line fell off of this little uh, fitting here, so we couldn't get fuel to flow out of the tank. Now this would come into play if it was full, we'd get fuel to flow, but as the tank emptied, it's about halfway, so we'd only have half a usable tank. So we'll replace that, we should be good to go. This is the point where a buddy comes in handy, not only to hold the enrichment circuit switch that's broken, but also to start pulling after I get tired in about 10 pulls. All right, here we go. Ooh, that was better than expected. Very much. Okay, so that was success with a little bit of a catch. I think my fuel pump has, uh, well, decided not to pump fuel. We had to manually fill the carb bowls. That's why it ran. But uh, I mean, it ran, it ran good. We actually had some smoke, so it means there's oil going around in this thing. Um, I'm calling that a win for now with uh, a repair to make. Get the airbox on and this thing's ready to go. 600 kilometer trail ride, here we come. Yeah. Up to now, we've just been talking about D-ring type of fasteners, but Superclamp has an interesting way of keeping your sled in place with their Superclamp cross ski clamps here, and also a second point of attachment at the back that holds the skid rail down. Now, you might be wondering what I'm doing with an old derelict snowmobile like this on a steel table being held down with Superclamps. Well, 
We're gonna figure out how strong these guys really are. Give me a couple minutes and I'll show you what I'm gonna do. So here's my idea. We've got a big heavy steel plate here that the super clamps are attached to, holding the snowmobile down to the steel plate. Back there, I've got chains going back to a shipping container that are gonna hold the steel plate in place with the sled on it. Then I'm gonna get in the loader that's gonna be hooked up to the chassis and I'm gonna back up. That should test the super clamps and the chassis to figure out which one's stronger. This is gonna be good. Wow, I didn't think those straps would break. Two more down for the count on this trip. So a bit of a win and a bit of a fail. That's because my weld that I had on the rings that held the super clamps in place, that weld down to the table, it failed, but the super clamps, they stayed in one piece. A little bit of damage right here, but basically that was with a loader pulling on this thing. So I think right now we've proven the strength of the super clamp, but I really want to see this sled become two sleds. That's way closer, but not two pieces yet. Yes, that's two pieces. All right. It's completely pointless. And we kind of lost track of our whole thing that we were doing, but hell, it's fun. Anyways, we got two snowmobiles now. Started with one, now we got two. Hey, thanks for coming along with us this week on Snowmobiler Television. Now, each winter, we all spend a ton of time with trucks and trailers driving down the road to go to our favorite snowmobile destination. So make sure you tie down your junk and stay safe on the road. STV has been brought to you by CKX. Wear your passion. On Snow Magazine, for snowmobilers, from snowmobilers. Even back then, I must have been anal retender or something. I took the time to paint in the Polaris on the, uh, the toolbox cover and on the, uh, the rear view mirrors. Of course, that was back in the days when I didn't know what the was.